I'm Kim McClary, President and CEO of the Los Angeles World Affairs Council and Town Hall. Apologies for a late start. We just were getting some technical issues taken care of. We are thrilled to be kicking off our eight week 2020 election series and could not have done it without the generosity of our sponsors and help from our many community partners. Specifically, I would like to highlight our sponsors, Andrew Tavacoli and Dan Schnur, who are both board members of the Council Town Hall, Dick Mader, an International Circle member, and Joel Moji, a Diplomat member. Gentlemen, thank you so very much for your continued support of our organization and mission. We hope everyone will enjoy this series of programming. So now, without further ado, I, it's my pleasure to introduce today's program, The Foreign Policy Stakes of the 2020 Election, with Dr. Mira Rapp Hooper, who is a senior fellow at China Center at Yale Law School, and Dr. Rebecca Listner, an assistant professor of strategic operational research at the U.S. Naval War College. I'd like to make a note that all views that Dr. Rap Hooper and Dr. Listener may make are their personal opinions and do not reflect their respective organizations. Our moderator today is Max Boot, author, historian, senior fellow of the Council on Foreign Relations. And Max will be moderating via audio today due to um, our technical issues, but we didn't want to hold up the program. So without further ado, Max, let me hand this program over to you. Thank you. All right, well, thanks very much. It's a uh, pleasure to be here with all of you. Sorry you can't actually see me, but I'm, I guess, just a disembodied voice, but you can see the two most important people in this discussion, Rebecca and Mira, who will be talking about their uh, important and informative new book, An Open World, How America Can Win the Contest for 21st Century Order, which I greatly recommend, really a thoughtful uh, take on U.S. strategy at such a pivotal moment uh, in our history. Uh, so let me begin by asking Rebecca and Mira, why uh, write this book now? Is this something that was motivated uh, by the Trump presidency, or uh, were there broader concerns that led you to take uh, uh, word processor in hand? Well, thank you so much, Max, and thank you to the Los Angeles World Affairs Council and Kim for having us. We're really delighted to be here and to be kicking off this important series. So, Max, to your question, this book makes the case that the U.S. needs to reimagine its foreign policy for a post-pandemic and potentially post-Trump world before it is too late. And we began this book in the immediate wake of the 2016 election when it was already clear to us that Donald Trump himself was more an avatar than an architect of the massive domestic and international upheavals that were reshaping American foreign policy. And even if Hillary Clinton had won in 2016, she would have still had to contend with these major forces, forces like long-term global power shifts that have been adversely affecting the United States global position, the importance of emerging and rapidly changing new technologies and the way that they're reshaping both domestic and international governance, and a long-term trend towards greater domestic political dysfunction at home. So in writing this book, we sought to take aim at two pieces of conventional wisdom. First, the notion that Donald Trump was himself solely responsible for the collapse of American international leadership and the international system that's often referred to as the liberal international order. And second, the idea that the United States could somehow revert to its foreign policy business as usual once Trump leaves office, whether that's in 2021 or 2025. And in examining those long-term trends that I just mentioned, our book effectively anticipated the foreign policy emergency that the United States now so obviously faces in the wake of the COVID pandemic, because COVID has tragically illustrated our central thesis. The idea that a set of international institutions, international norms, and international laws that were built in the wake of World War II for the problems of the 1940s are simply not suited to the challenges of the 2040s, and a new approach is needed, and the United States needs to lead that way forward. Well, talk about uh, your new approach and the one sort of embodied in, in the title of the book, An Open World. What does that mean? 
Well, Max, um, before jumping in, I'll say first my thanks to you uh, for moderating this conversation with us. It's really an honor to be in conversation with you and to the LA World Affairs Council team. The open world, uh, which is featured in our title, is such because we see there as being something of a battle underway to write the rules and norms of the 21st century. And the United States can only be safe if those rules and norms are written towards openness. Now, what do we mean by that? Well before the COVID-19 pandemic landed on our shores, authoritarians were increasingly uh, advocating for closure on the global stage, expanding their influence in their regions, seeking to close off pieces of the global commons and write new technological rules that would create closed systems of information raising the risk that the United States and its allies could increasingly live in a world where parts of it became inaccessible. But US prosperity and national security have long depended on interdependence and cooperation. And the United States can only stay safe in a world that stays open. But openness will no longer be won by the United States being able to dominate the military sphere or every economic or political issue. Rather, openness will be achieved if the United States and friends and partners band together and adopt a strategy that seeks to keep the international system open. So we're calling on Washington to do exactly that at a time when it would be very easy to do otherwise. Now, isn't that a pretty traditional U.S. approach? Wasn't the U.S. hasn't the U.S. been interested in promoting openness and uh, international rule of law uh, and a kind of law-abiding, uh, more democratic uh, international system that that is open, especially to trade uh, and to the transmission of ideas? Hasn't the U.S. really been doing that? Uh, since the 1940s. So what's what's different about advocating an, an open world strategy? So you can certainly see echoes of openness throughout the history of American foreign relations. And in particular, if you look back at what FDR wanted to achieve at the end of World War II, he was actually talking in many ways about an open world that shares many similar goals with the strategy that we're describing. The problem is once the Iron Curtain descended upon the world, openness foundered. It was unrealized because there were large swaths of the world that were controlled by the Soviet Union and were not actually permeable to American military access or commercial access to trade to outside ideas. Then when the Soviet Union fell, the United States found itself at the peak of its power and the end of history seemed to be upon us. And the United States actually set out to achieve something substantially more ambitious than openness. It set out to spread its own model of democratic liberalism to all corners of the world. Now, as we have seen over the past several decades, that vision of liberal universalism actually ran up against some pretty significant challenges even as it tried to bring China, for example, into the fold through its accession to the World Trade Organization, it found that China itself politically did not liberalize. So the central wager that liberalism could reign supreme has been discredited. So now we find ourselves after almost four years of a Donald Trump administration that has actually rejected both the central wager of openness as it has been practiced by previous presidents, which is to say that he doesn't subscribe to the same ideas about economic interdependence, the importance of international cooperation and American leadership, the importance of leveraging allies and partners to achieve these openness aims. But he's also rejected the liberal universalism of the immediate post-Cold War period. So what we have now is a framework of America first nationalism that has in many ways invited foreign meddling into the American political system that has abjured the use of alliances as an important instrument of American foreign policy and that has withdrawn from important international institutions most recently like the World Health Organization. So the openness strategy that we recommend is actually a departure, both from the more ambitious and in some ways hubristic vision of American foreign policy that we saw for many of the post-Cold War decades, but also from the America first closure and nationalism of the Trump administration. So this is a way forward that is novel and that we also think has a unique opportunity to succeed, not only in remaking American foreign policy, but also remaking the international order, which is to say the laws and the norms and the institutions that govern the relationships between states for the 21st century. 
Well, you write that uh, we can have we can pursue this openness strategy quote without insisting upon the spread of liberal dom domestic governance as a prerequisite. I mean, is that really giving up on democracy promotion as a key tenant of U.S. foreign policy? Something that we've argu arguably been doing for a very long time, and isn't that in fact something that actually puts you perhaps arguably on the same side as Trump uh, and other? Uh, so-called realists who don't think that uh, that countries' uh, political uh, systems or or internal political affairs uh, should be of great concern to us. And what does that does that mean that we should be ignoring, you know, uh, uh, Chinese or Russian or North Korean or Iranian uh, or, for that matter, Saudi uh, human rights violations? It's a really important question, Max. Um, and the answer strictly is no. The openness strategy for which we are advocating certainly still has a strong preference for democracy wherever we can find it, uh, seeks to defend it wherever it exists, um, and ultimately seeks to uphold the existing international norms and laws that have prevailed for the last several decades. But it also recognizes that America's chief authoritarian competitors, namely China, but also Russia, are likely to be with us for a very long time. And that the United States is going to have to devise for itself a strategy for living in the world with those competitors until their people choose another form of government. So let me say just a little bit about that. Um, the openness strategy uh, for which we recommend, to which that that which we recommend, uh, is really uh, about emphasizing the importance of good governance on the international stage, um, certainly with a preference for democracy, but accepting that it is possible for non-democratic countries to nonetheless govern themselves transparently. What we mean by that is that uh, while the United States still should seek to make common cause with democratic friends and partners wherever it can, it should also be willing to work with countries that may not be democracies if they are willing to establish and play by the rules of good governance on the international stage. Thinking there of countries like Vietnam um, that may be a single party system, but nonetheless willing to work with the United States uh, where there is mutual interest in doing so. And the reason that we think it's important to do this is because the reality of living alongside a stronger China and a revanchist Russia means that the United States will not ultimately in the immediate term succeed in creating a world where liberal values pervade every corner of the globe. Instead, it will have to fight to defend openness where it sees it challenged in Asia as China continues to rise at the United Nations as China co-opts the Human Rights Council, um, or even when it comes to governing new technologies. So if the United States is to be able to do that, that is seek to keep the world open in all of those spaces, it's going to have to join with like-minded friends and partners wherever it can find them. And that means sometimes working with countries that aren't democracies where our interests intersect. Ultimately, we strongly hope that countries like Russia and China will become democratic, uh, but for the time being, we intend to focus on defending democracy where we find it and crafting the strategies that will allow the international system to stay open, even in spite of authoritarian preferences. Well, I get the idea of working with non-democratic countries, and certainly that's something we've always done. But I guess where, where I'm still uncertain is to what extent uh, should we be calling attention to human rights abuses and making that a key part of U.S. foreign policy today, for example, uh, in relation to China? Should we be talking about the oppression of the Uyghurs, the crackdown in Hong Kong with Russia? Should we be talking about the poisoning of Alexei Navalny? Uh, should, th should these be of central concern uh, to the United States or should we just say, well, uh, you know, we, we need to work with these countries, so we're not going to emphasize uh, their uh, human rights violations. So let me just sort of take a step back first in answering your question, because I want to be really clear for our audience what an openness strategy is and what it is about. Right. So an, the core objective of an openness strategy is to keep the world open and to promote open interactions between states which means that all nations should be able to make free and independent political decisions, that the global commons of sea and space and air stay open, and also that in different nations cooperate with each other through a modernized set of international institutions. 
In so doing, the openness strategy seeks to prevent the coalescence of any types of closed blocks or closed spheres of influence at the hands of especially authoritarian powers like China and Russia. It seeks to prevent foreign interference in independent electoral processes. And it also seeks to prevent any country from hiving off vital portions of the globe geographically or vital technological or information spaces from access by the United States. And it recognizes in all of that, that the chief antagonist of openness is China, because China is the only country that both has a preference for closure and the ability to bring it about. So when we're thinking in the big picture about a world in which human rights are protected or democracy is protected, that is certainly a world in which China is not able to coercively dominate its own region or other regions. Uh, through whether through sort of overt territorial um, annexation, like something that you know one could imagine happening between China and Taiwan, but also through more subtler, subtler 20th century means, 21st century means, such as you know the construction of 5G digital infrastructure that then allows China to export its own authoritarian ideas by undermining free expression or promoting censorship in other places. So I think when you're talking about the global sense, an openness strategy is definitely one that is on the side of human rights and in many ways democracy. But as you point out, a central tenet of our strategy is this pivot from the idea of democracy promotion, an idea that has been very closely associated with military efforts at regime change over the past several decades, which have manifestly failed in almost every instance, towards this idea of democracy support. That is looking at especially democratic allies and partners who are themselves backsliding in their own democratic commitments and institutions and values and trying to work with them to shore them up. Not to mention shoring up American democracy at home, because we recognize that you know, democracy here is a precondition for democracy abroad. Now, to your more specific question about what do we do about particular instances of human rights violations, to be sure, an openness strategy does not require that the United States remain silent, for example, about the Chinese government's treatment of Uyghur Muslims or about the Russian poisoning of Navalny or you know, other dissidents. In fact, there are a body of human rights conventions and protocols that are already on the books that countries like China and Russia have signed on to. And so by renovating the set of international institutions that we already have and strengthening them and regaining American leadership within them, we can actually use the letter of those pre-existing institutions in order to call out these egregious human rights abuses, recognizing at the same time that there's basically nothing the United States can do in the near term to actually change the character of the Russian regime or the Chinese regime, and we really shouldn't try. You also... Um... Uh, right, that the U.S. does not possess, nor does it require, strategic primacy to guarantee its security and prosperity. So is your strategy basically premised on America being a lot less powerful in the future than it has been uh, in the past? And should we be trying to preserve our primacy uh, to the greatest extent possible, or should we just write that off as a lost cause? Well, Max, our research has led us to believe that the United States still remains mighty by most measures. Uh, that is to say, we would uh, not want to change places with most other countries throughout history. But it also recognizes that since the period of America's post-Cold War peak, it has experienced relative decline. And as a result, it's going to have to craft a new strategy for a world in which it is relatively more constrained, even if it remains quite powerful. Um, so first, um, it bears noting the fact that there are numerous areas of persistent American advantage, despite the fact uh, that China has in many ways closed the power gap. Uh, whether you're thinking about the fact that the United States retains dollar dominance um, in the fact that the dollar is uh, used to transact throughout the world, the fact that we remain dominant in terms of GDP per capita, um, in terms of our education and university systems, um, or many other metrics, the United States is still in an enviable position um, and is likely to stay ahead in many of these metrics for some time to come. Nevertheless, it's undeniably the case that our power is not what it was at the immediate end of the Cold War. For a good 20 years after the Soviet Union collapsed, the United States did not have a military competitor in sight. 
it was nearly unrivaled economically in its prowess. And once you add its allies to those ledgers, it was all the more powerful and almost untouchable. What we do recognize is that period of truly uncontested dominance has come to an end because it is undeniable that China is a challenger in the military, economic, and political spheres. Rather than try to expend energy recouping a form of primacy, which is very likely uh, vanished and, and now in our history, we are recommending doubling down on the strengths that we have to keep the world open, safe, and prosperous for many decades to come. So while we do recognize a diminution relatively in American power, we also identify several sources of strength that are leaving the United States in this position to continue to help write the rules for the 21st century for many years to come. What do you think is gonna be the impact on US standing in the world of the multiple crises uh, that we have encountered this year? I mean, I think about the fact that uh, we're going to lose upwards of 200,000 Americans to coronavirus, far more than any other country. We've seen an economic implosion, uh, the worst one since the Great uh, Depression. We've seen massive protests over uh, racial injustice. Uh, we are seeing, uh, because of the uh, recession, uh, ballooning uh, uh, budget deficits, the federal uh, 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 debt is going to is going to match our total GDP next year, a milestone we have not hit since World War II. Um, I mean, does that all of that uh, put more pressure on the U.S. to curtail its uh, international leadership, its foreign engagement, and, and concentrate on problems at home? Max, that's a great question, and you're absolutely right to turn the focus inward, because one of the key findings of our book is actually that it is these domestic phenomena, in many ways these domestic shortcomings, that are the greatest challenge that the United States faces going forward. So even before the pandemic, it was already clear that the United States was operating well below its capacity as a foreign policy actor. And the reason for that really comes down to two core divisions. The first core division has to do with divisions within the American people and the way in which they are acutely polarized from each other, primarily along partisan lines. And the way that this partisan polarization has been undermining American foreign policy from within, among many other pernicious consequences. But when you're thinking about partisan polarization from a foreign policy perspective, it becomes clear that the dramatic swings in policy that accompany the changing hands of the White House whenever a Democrat gives way to a Republican, gives way to a Democrat, actually undermine the United States' ability to make credible commitments to both allies and adversaries. Think there about the Iran nuclear deal and the question of whether even if there is a President Biden, will Iran want to do another deal with the United States knowing that we had so quickly and easily walked away from the first one. Not only that, but the deep fissures within the American polity also invite foreign election interference because other countries see that there are these chasms that they can exploit by sowing disinformation that takes Americans farther away from each other and also hampers our ability to respond. We know, for example, that Russia has frequently sown disinformation and tried to exacerbate racial divisions within this country. We also know that Russia intervened in the 2016 election on behalf of Donald Trump and seems to be trying to do so again. And yet the fact that it benefited a Republican president has meant that Republicans in Congress have been unwilling to mount an effective response, leaving America's democracy persistently vulnerable to this foreign threat. So that partisan polarization and also racial polarization is a major problem for American foreign policy. But it's not the only division that matters. There's also a widening gulf between the United States' core domestic innovation base, which is to say its technology sector, and the federal government. As decades of underinvestment by the federal government in research and development and in basic research has led tech companies to chase market incentives, many of which exist overseas, and has misaligned the incentives of places like Silicon Valley with the national interest, which means that the US federal government is less able to marshal this considerable domestic innovation capacity for its national interest, 
which comes at a time when authoritarian powers like China are actually perfecting new forms of digital authoritarianism and tightening their grip in that way. And then enters COVID, which shows that our domestic underinvestments are even worse than we already knew that they were. State and local capacity is paltry. The federal medical stockpiles were basically emptied out before this had even started. And the domestic public is polarized even on really basic questions, like whether it's important to wear a mask in the workplace. And so I think this amounts to a consistent picture. As Mira said, the United States still remains incredibly powerful by many important metrics. There is no nation on earth that has a military as powerful as ours. The United States place in the global financial system is effectively unrivaled. We still have the largest GDP by some measures in the world and will continue to be in the top three for the next several decades. But the United States is performing tragically below its capacity. And so an openness strategy really take seriously the need to revitalize the United States at home as the foundation for everything that we want to do in the world going forward. And what do we do about our defense spending? Can we afford uh, to continue spending 700 billion a year or more on defense given the ballooning uh, federal debt and given all of the demands at home, especially on the uh, healthcare front? Yeah, Max, as, as you know better than anyone, um, there are any number of folks who would argue that we can afford anything we want right now, and there are no constraints on any kinds of spending, but we take a more circumspect view than that. Uh, we don't think that we can afford to have defense spending continue to balloon. Um, that is, that it shouldn't continue increasing. Um, and maybe there, in fact, is a good case for modestly decreasing defense spending, at least uh, back to the levels it was in 2016. And the reason for that is while it is entirely possible that the United States could still face a major military challenge from a great power uh, like Russia or China, as well as a regional power, most of the competition that we will continue to see in the 21st century will be non-military. And as a result, we need to rebuild the other aspects of our government that are necessary to taking on those challenges headlong. If we don't continue to raise our defense spending, we instead can reinvest in rebuilding the State Department, which of course is urgently needed as so many of America's greatest challenges must be dealt with first and foremost through diplomacy and development. We need to reinvest in and refurbish our intelligence community because the fact that so many of these challenges come from non-military areas only raises the premium on having exquisite intelligence that becomes actionable for the United States and its partners. We need to invest in relationships between the private and public sector, which will be so critical to making sure that the United States can actually harness its technological base. And we need to reinvest in our foreign policy workforce and processes to overcome the unbelievable erosion of talent and expertise that has occurred over just the last four years. So we see the world ahead as full of any number of challenges, certainly financial, but that the geopolitical challenges that face us call first and foremost for a reinvestment in a far broader range of tools of diplomacy so that we can take on issues like pandemics and climate change, just as well as we can take on a great power competitor in the military space. Well, with that, I'm gonna stop asking questions and turn it over to the audience. I believe we have a number of questions, so. Uh, Jessica, do you want to take that away? Yes, thank you so much, Max, and thank you for bearing with us through the technical issues today. Um, if you'd like to send in a question, you can do so on the control panel in your question section. Um, if it's directed at Rebecca or Mira or even Max, uh, just make a note of that as well. Uh, so the first question, um, and I'll, I'll let you decide who of you should uh, answer this. You guys have been doing a great job so far. Um, hi, and thanks for this discussion. The subtitle of the book is How America Can Win the Contest for 21st Century Order. It's framing the path forward for America as a contest that requires us to win the best way to engage international relations as we advance further into the 21st century. Well, that is such a terrific question, and it's something that we've actually thought quite a bit about. 
because there is a battle underway between forces of openness and interdependence and forces of closure and nationalism. And it's raging within the US as we've seen the United States turn to unprecedented closures of borders and restrictions on trade in response to the coronavirus pandemic. And also the economic crisis that COVID has precipitated is really redoubling the energy behind sort of America first nationalism that Donald Trump has expounded uh, you know, throughout his tenure in the White House and even beforehand. Meanwhile, on the international stage, you see American allies like Japan and Germany really sort of fighting for this vision of an open world, but struggling as the United States retreats internally. And meanwhile, Russia and China are increasingly cooperating with each other to bring about closure. And then interestingly, you also have states like India that are in many ways hinge states because in some ways its interests align with the United States as a democracy, also increasingly as a country that's fearful of China and wanting to align with a sort of open type vision of what the future of the Indo-Pacific region looks like, uh, but also in other ways, aligning with a certain more Chinese vision of, for example, cyber sovereignty uh, in the way that India has shut down its internet uh, for prolonged periods of time, for example, in Kashmir. And so there is something of a battle underway, but winning doesn't look like what we used to think that it looked like, which is to say the United States is not going to convert Russia, China, or any number of authoritarian powers to its idea of openness. They are never going to be in complete alignment with us about their own preferences for what international politics look like. But nevertheless, we can win by just preventing closure from happening abroad, which means that we can, if we can prevent China from closing off any part of Asia or any vital information space or waterway from, like the South China Sea, then in fact, we will have won. We will have achieved openness without bringing them on board to our side of the equation. However, to do that, we can really only do it if we pursue this openness strategy, which our book describes, but also if the United States works really hard to maintain a correlation of forces that favors openness. Because even as we're not going to bring China on board to our vision for what the international trading system should look like, the only way to prevent China's vision of what it should look like from coalescing is by joining with other partners, allies, other major economies to really build a strong coalition for openness that has the effect of preventing closure from from crystallizing. And so we've been talking here about a lot of different elements of international order, but I think one to really lift up is the future of technological order, where China is being very entrepreneurial and trying to define the terms of what data security norms should look like in the future, for example, or what internet governance should look like in the future. And this is an area where if the US doesn't step up and doesn't proactively articulate a vision that it shares with like-minded partners, then China's preferences will prevail, which is in effect losing. So this isn't to say that we need to enter a new Cold War with China or that we need to change China's internal character, uh, but it does recognize that there are these forces arrayed against each other and that the outcome of what is a contest over the future of international order will be highly determinative for the nature of 21st century geopolitics. Thank you. And this next question is kind of a follow up to that. Um, what position should the U.S. take towards China, particularly considering the repression of the Uyghurs, the Tibetan Buddhists, Hong Kong citizens and internet free speech and free press suppression, even if the CCP approaches global issues on an open basis. Oh, um, I can't hear you, Mira, I'm sorry. Sorry, it took a minute to <laughs> unmute myself. It, it's a really important je question, Jessica, and it draws us back to Max's really great line of questioning earlier. Uh, the United States and its like-minded partners and allies must press China wherever it is necessary to live according to open principles and open interactions. That means even while accepting that the character of the Chinese Communist Party is not likely to change in the immediate term and until the Chinese people decide that the nature of their regime should change, we can nonetheless insist that China operate on the international stage according to open principles. Now, what does that mean? It means that China should not be allowed to close off portions of the global commons, like the South China Sea, turning them into a Chinese lake. It means that China should not be allowed to establish a set of 
norms and governing principles for the internet and information that allow it to spread its model of a closed internet, thereby preventing the free exchange of ideas. And it means that China should not be allowed to erode norms of human rights by participating in the UN Human Rights Council, blocking resolutions against its own activities within its borders, and eroding the status of Hong Kong and proceeding with impunity. Uh, but these are very hard charges. That is to say that given the preferences that China has already demonstrated for closure, the United States is only going to be able to stand up to China and compete in all of these areas if it does so with friends and allies by its side and if it takes a repeated insistence to keeping the international system open. What that means is certainly that the United States is going to have to band together with allies inside of Asia to insist on principles like freedom of navigation within the South China Sea. It's going to have to pool resources and intellectual capabilities with democratic partners to create democratic, secure alternatives to China's 5G networks so that China can't succeed in closing off the information spaces uh, that we so dearly rely upon. And it's going to have to take a hard and relentless line on human rights that is nonetheless based in existing international law, banding together with like-minded allies to issue reports or statements on the deteriorating human rights conditions in Xinjiang or Hong Kong, even understanding that it's going to be very difficult to get the CCP to change its approach. Um, so what this all means is that openness, primarily when it comes to China, is the primary objective of our competition, that we can only win it if we do it multilaterally, and that it's going to be a long, hard slog. Thank you. Um, this next questioner says, all this sounds great, but how should the U.S. react to international organizations that are ineffective and or resistant to change? Robert Lighthizer recently penned an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal proposing reforms, reforms to the World Trade Organization with the recommendation that the U.S. lead the changes, but leave the WTO if it will not reform. So this is a really important issue, and it goes back to the argument that we made earlier, that many of the institutions that were born out of the Second World War and built for the challenges of 1945 are simply not suited to the challenges of 2045. And when you look at an institution like the WTO, which really emerged in the 1990s, the world has changed considerably since then, and that institution has lagged behind. So what an openness strategy seeks to do is effectively to renovate international institutions that have become badly outmoded. So where those institutions already exist, like the WTO, we, produce, we pursue a multi-track strategy. Yes, the U.S. should seek to reform the WTO from within, for example, to extend its remit to cover trade and digital services, which is a massive and growing part of the international economy, yet is not covered by existing WTO regulations. Also to address China's state-owned enterprises, which have massive distortionary effects and are unfair to American businesses and American workers, and yet are not adequately addressed through the WTO framework. So WTO reform of the institution itself is absolutely vital. But we're also realistic in understanding that it's a consensus-based organization, and that type of reform may not be immediately in the offing. And so we also advocate for the pursuit of high standards, both when it comes to labor, environment, and other issues, international trade agreements that the U.S. can pursue in conjunction with allies and partners that build an international trading system and a set of rules on top of the WTO system that really seeks to lift them up towards fairer, better, higher standard practices. And in so doing, it hopes that we can change the incentive structures that face large countries like China by basically forcing them to play by our preferred set of rules because it will become in their economic interest to do so. But this isn't just about trade. There are other massive parts of international life that are effectively un or undergoverned. There is very little by way of a strong regime for to address climate change. So not only does the US need to re-enter the Paris Climate Agreement, but there also is much more that it can do to actually push farther both in exceeding its Paris targets itself, but also using instruments like high standards trades agreements in order to propagate more climate friendly, more environmentally friendly international standards elsewhere. 
Similarly, as I mentioned a moment ago, in the technological space, there are basically no rules to govern, for example, for example, killer robots in warfare, or how foreign owned apps like TikTok should operate with our data when we use them on our phones. These are critical elements of our daily life in the 21st century that also have an important geopolitical valence, and there are just no international protocols that govern how they work. So a central component of the strategy is not walking away from institutions that don't immediately serve us, but renovating them and pushing for a whole new set of regimes and norms and structures that encode the idea of openness into 21st century international governance. And COVID has made it very clear that that can only happen if it's an effort that the United States leads, because in the absence of American leadership, I think the devastation that COVID has wrought as a sort of undergoverned element of the global health space, um, it demonstrates that future disorder is going to be even worse. Thank you. Why do you think Democrats allow Donald Trump to own the America first rhetoric? Both parties have always represented American interests first. Why does it seem no one on the left diffuses this topic and eliminates it as a Trump defining claim? That's a very interesting question. Um, I, I won't uh, opine on behalf of the, the Democratic Party or the American left, but what I will say is that I think the questioner is getting at something really important, which is that uh, in, in many ways, the last four years, and certainly the crisis we are all living through now, has blown open the distinction between foreign and domestic policy. That's part of what brought us to this project in the first place. That is the feeling that uh, domestic upheaval in the United States appeared to vastly be changing our role in the world. And I think it's something that has been made even more apparent as the COVID crisis has landed on our shores. Ultimately, what we're advocating for here in this openness strategy is a strategy that seeks to keep the United States safe and prosperous through this pursuit of international openness. But something that has happened all too much in recent decades is a foreign policy based on American nostalgia. That is, you'll often hear foreign policy leaders advocating for the United States to support their allies or support the so-called liberal international order because of shared history, um, because of shared norms. But the real reason that the United States should be pursuing a strategy of openness that seeks to keep the world accessible and interdependent is because that's the only way to keep the American people safe and prosperous, and indeed to restore that safety and prosperity at a time where it appears to be being wrenched away from us. So what I would really affirm um, to take it back to this questioner is that all foreign policy should be framed in terms of what can keep the United States and the American people safe and prosperous. We think we've got an answer to that charge, but we should all ask our leaders and politicians to raise themselves to that same standard. Thank you. COVID-19, as President Trump points out, started in China but when it arrived in the US, never declared it a national security threat, and now 189,000 US citizens are dead. Can you explain differences in US response to a natural pandemic health threat versus DOD goals of protecting the US against defense, including biological warfare issues? So what this question really gets at is that the definition of national security that has been guiding American foreign policy since the end of the Cold War is massively inadequate. We have spent untold amounts of money to prosecute military interventions overseas and then have found a vastly larger number of Americans threatened at home by this pandemic than we've even seen, you know, by orders of magnitude, for example, die at the hand, uh, hands of terrorists over the past several decades. So American foreign policy is badly out of whack. And for all the reasons Mira described earlier, it needs to be reoriented. Reoriented in order to address challenges like the COVID pandemic, but also other non-traditional security challenges like climate change, which also has the potential not only to yield future pandemics, but also to yield mass migration and other types of upheaval internationally, food insecurity, not to mention you know, the extreme weather I know that many of you are experiencing in Los Angeles right now. So all of that is going to take a reconceptualization of what American foreign policy is about that rebalances the toolkit away from the military instrument of power, even as 
some element of that will of course remain very important and rebalances us in favor of a set of tools that are more suited to 21st century challenges. As Mira said, that includes a revitalized State Department, that includes a renovated set of alliances and partnerships that are fit for purpose in working together to address these non-traditional challenges. It means better enlisting the private sector in an openness strategy so that the America's engine of innovation and our capitalist economy is actually harnessed to the national interest in a way that it just isn't right now. So all of those changes are sorely necessary and it does mean that we need to de-emphasize the role of the military in our foreign policy and instead really turn our attention to not only building a country at home that is revitalized and resilient to this types of disruptions, but also a foreign policy toolkit that can advance our interests overseas as we seek to build a set of rules and norms and laws and institutions for the next century that reflect the principles of openness and do keep Americans safe, secure, and prosperous in an open world. Thank you. Um, we have a couple of questions on military spending, so I'm going to combine them. Hopefully um, this won't be too confusing. Has anyone measured the effectiveness of our military spending? The proverbial question of whether we're getting the bang for our buck, no pun intended. And then um, someone else said they agree we spend way too much on the military. How do we cut it, cut it given Congress is corrupted by money? Well, I'm happy to take first crack at this. Um, and then I'll, I'll see if Rebecca um, wants to jump in as well, given her Naval War College expertise. Um, I uh, think that we have many academic studies that uh, analyze sort of various measures of military effectiveness. Um, but the question is really motivated by whether or not the United States is getting the most out of, out as, as it could out of the 700 plus uh, billion dollars that it spends on its military on an annual basis. And I think we have come to the judgment um, that it is not. And that is, of course, because the sum itself is absolutely enormous. And because so many of our needs on the global stage are, in fact, not military at all. Um, now, we already sort of outlined um, some of what we think are the necessary cuts and reinvestments um, that are necessary to make to right size our national security spending in a way that is appropriately fit to the 21st century. Um, but when it comes to what that actually might look like from the Department of the, the Department of Defense side, I think um, there are a number of different areas that we could point to. Um, one is that the Department of Defense remains heavily invested in a lot of legacy platforms um, that are really vestiges of former military interventions and not representative of how we're likely to fight in the 21st century. Um, given the importance that we place on the American innovation base, we would like to see the Department of Defense and the US government as a whole reinvest much more heavily in research and development and in the basic research that will guide the military technologies of the future. Um, in addition to that, we would like to see the government outside of the Pentagon investing in better intelligence capabilities, investing in the State Department capabilities that will allow us to counter things like adversary election interference and disinformation. That, of course, includes um, global public messaging capabilities um, and far broader diplomatic toolkits to respond to those types of uh, political interference. Um, and overall, we would like to see a national security budget that is rebalanced to better represent diplomacy, development, intelligence, and the broad range of tools that is going to allow us to respond, again, to things like pandemics and climate change. But I'll stop myself there to see if Rebecca wants to add anything to this question. I thought that was a great response, and I'm mindful that we are winding down on time. So the only thing I would add is just when you think about all the trillions of dollars that the United States has spent on the defense budget over the past several decades, so many of them went to the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan and the broader sort of endless war on terrorism. And while the openness strategy takes the continued, albeit sort of minimized threat of terrorism seriously, we resoundly reject the use of military interventions as a tool of armed overseas regime change. And when you take that out of the equation, that in and of itself helps right size the defense budget and the national security portfolio more broadly, because quite simply, there will not be Iraq wars in a world in which we implement this strategy. And doing that means that we would save 
trillions of dollars, not to mention the considerable lives of both Americans and Iraqis. So I think that the shift from democracy promotion, which has so often been an armed endeavor to democracy support in itself means that we're not gonna go out and seeking monsters to destroy, but rather we'll invest in the cutting edge capabilities that are needed to prevent war through strong deterrence, especially of great power adversaries like China. Thank you so much. And this will be our final question. And uh, I know we got started a little bit late, so I apologize. How can the United States more effectively counteract and neutralize the cyber espionage of China and other foreign actors? I can get started on that one. Um, so this is a really important question because, again, as we're thinking ahead to what 21st century threats are going to look like, so many of them are going to occur in the commercial space, in the technological space, in the economic space, and they don't look like the types of military threats that we are accustomed to seeing. So an openness strategy takes this kind of threat really seriously, and it does so in a few ways. So first, it seeks, as I said before, to build a new set of norms around what kind of cyber behavior is acceptable. And right now, those simply don't exist. There are no agreed upon international norms around what type of cyber espionage is or is not okay and what might trigger what kinds of responses. There are not international norms around election interference via digital means. And there aren't international norms around what kind of cyber attacks would trigger what kind of responses or what are acceptable or unacceptable. For example, attacks on critical infrastructure like electricity grids. So the United States really needs to lead in trying to write a new set of rules that speak to this distinctly novel set of technologically enabled challenges. But again, we're not gonna be able to convince all countries in the world and including the countries most responsible for these types of malign cyber activities to necessarily sign on to the set of rules that we prefer. And that's why we also need to work together with our allies and partners to adapt those relationships to better address these types of very real 21st century threats that we do face and to set what are called new deterrence thresholds which is to say if certain types of cyber attacks are prosecuted against the united states or one of our nato allies what type of attack would trigger what type of response and by making those thresholds more explicit we can prevent those types of attacks from happening in the first place because our adversaries will know that a considerable response will await them if they try to do it. I'll, I'll add just one uh, quick detail onto Rebecca's excellent answer, um, which is to say that I think exactly where Rebecca landed is, is a critical place for the United States to start with this agenda. That is thinking about how its alliances can be renovated to apply in cyberspace. Specifically because the US alliance system has been so successful in deterring and defending against conflict, but also because so many of our 21st century threats are non military, it's critical for Washington to think about not only how its NATO alliance may apply in cyberspace, but also how its alliances in Asia may apply in cyberspace. Rebecca already alluded to one of these key areas, which would be cyber attacks on critical infrastructure, which could be totally devastating and have effects like an armed attack. Another would be a cyber attack on military command and control, which would be similarly devastating. But by banding together with allies, both across Europe and Asia, and having these conversations that seek to set new thresholds, the United States and these like-minded allies can establish deterrence in new areas, even as they scramble to try to set new rules and norms in these undergoverned spaces to try to keep China from doing the same. Fantastic. Thank you both so much. Um, I'm going to turn this back so over to Max and uh, thank you again. Well, thank you very much for a uh, very enlightening and interesting discussion. I think you've, you've seen today or heard today why Rebecca and Mira are two of the uh, smartest strategy analysts around. And I would just uh, wrap up by thanking them for uh, their uh, commentary and even more for their book, uh, which I would commend to all of you uh, from uh, Yale University Press and Open World. It was a pleasure to be on with you and only sorry that uh, it was by, by voice only. And thanks to the uh, World Affairs Council and uh, all my friends in LA for uh, putting this together. Max, Rebecca, Mira, thank you just for a, a tremendously informative discussion, giving us great roadmap forward for our foreign policy. We so appreciate your time 
and your expertise. And as Max said, they have this terrific book out, An Open World, How America Can Win the Contest for the 21st Century Order. So if you all would look on your control panel and click on the word chat, we provide you with a link to how to purchase their book. And as you all know, we're doing all these live streams for free as a public service. So if you can help us out, please text the word GIVE, G-I-V-E, to the phone number on the screen and give what you can so we can continue to provide you with quality programming like today. We have a terrific lineup of programs in September. Thursday, Dan Schnur is back with Politics in the Time of Coronavirus. Friday, we have the Mexican ambassador to the United States, Martha Barcena Coqui, in conversation with Maria Contreras Sweet. We also have General John Allens from the Brookings Institution next week. And in September, conversations with Fiona Hill, Anne Marie Slaughter, and Jill, Jill Lapore. Excuse me. Please go to our website at lawac.org and register for those programs today. Mira, Rebecca, Max, thank you again so very much. This was tremendous. Everybody stay safe, stay informed, and we'll see you Thursday. Thank you.